So welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope you had a good stretch. Um, so now I want to go on to the second part. I want to introduce you to the ideas of attoseconds, so attosecond technology, and using extreme nonlinear optics. Um, it's hard when you're doing this not to somehow summarize the first one, even though it's only half an hour past, so I'm not sure this is relevant. But let me just do it in two or three view graphs. I want to emphasize again that a short pulse is just an interference in time. There's nothing nonlinear in it. The only nonlinearity comes from making it, but not, or measuring it, but not in its existence. It's just an interference in time. You're adding many different frequencies together, just adding them up and seeing what they look like, and that's what a short pulse is. Okay? So, so to make a short pulse, we needed a nonlinear process to phase the different frequencies together. I think that's another thing you should have got from the first lecture. And to measure a short pulse, we need a nonlinear process to determine if all the frequencies are phased together. Otherwise, each frequency sees only itself and interferes only with itself or in this time-dependent way. Uh, with making a short pulse. But if you make a long-term measurement, it interferes only with itself. To measure a fast process, also, we need nonlinearity. So nonlinearities are everywhere in short pulses, except in the pulse itself, where it's just a linear interference. Okay? So I think a general question, while you're sitting here and looking at that, and after, you, after you've thought about perturbative nonlinear optics for four or five days, what opportunities are opened by the extreme nonlinear optics that I'm going to introduce? So think of it as I go through. What opportunities are opened by this very different nonlinear optics? So this is the figure you saw before. In this figure, I talked about what happened from the beginning of the laser until 1986. 1986, we reached uh, six femtosecond pulses and basically we're stuck at that level for roughly 15 years. To make the transition to the new time to add a seconds required us to give up on perturbative nonlinear optics. You know what we used? We used chi-3 process N2, which is a process in which four photons are interplay. So again, you know. So we have to give up in this perturbative nonlinear optics and we go to a new op nonlinear optics, which you might call extreme nonlinear optics. So some people call it extreme nonlinear optics. You even probably now have a sense for how it works. So if you want to think about this in photons, and we come back to the ground state, there are many things that are similar. We start at some state, but in this case, instead of making these transitions, virtual transitions, you bring an electron out from the atom, out into the continuum, drive it around a path, which is not, of course, like that in reality, but we might indicate it like that, and it comes back again and collides with the ion from which it left, returns to the ion. That's the large current density that I ended with the last time. And when it comes back, it's free to recombine back to the ground state. So it's still a parametric process, in the way we heard in the very first day. Starts in the ground state, returns to the ground state, but it involves many, 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 many photons along in this process. So many that you would not even want to try to think of it in this way. There would be so many pathways, it would just be a nightmare. It would be a, it would be a mess. You don't think of it that way at all. It's just the wrong way to think of it. So everything you know about perturbative nonlinear optics throw out and think, start thinking much more in the way of electrons moving along trajectories. <clears throat> so here is an illustration of the process. So this is, I want now you to think about this. And once you understand this, you will understand everything else I have to say. Anytime you lose me, go back and think about what this shows, and you will pick up what I'm saying. I've only made a disguised way of making this so you don't quite see it. So you take an atom. It will be a gas of atoms, but we'll take one atom to start with, or a molecule, or I'm going to say at the end, a solid. We take an electron from that atom. Shown here, it's being formed classically. 
but you already know it will tunnel. So here's an electron just coming out, and it comes out around the time when the field is strong. The fields that are involved, we already talked about, are around 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter to ionize most things at these kind, at any wavelength around here, it's tunneling, so it's not wavelength sensitive. The field is required is about 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter, about three volts per angstrom. Three volts per angstrom is not subtle. The electron must move under the influence of such a field, even on a sub-cycle, sub-laser cycle basis. And so as the, as the field varies, the electron gains momentum, and by, time, by the time it comes to the zero crossing, it has substantial momentum. The momentum then carries it uphill as the field changes its direction, and depending on its moment of birth, it will return at some time. If it's born late in the cycle, it doesn't gain so much momentum, it doesn't get so far uphill, and it returns early, colliding with the ion early. If it's born earlier in the cycle, it gains more momentum, moves uphill further, returns, goes up to closer to the peak of the field, and is driven back and returns with more energy later in the cycle. If it's born at the optimum time, which is 17 degrees after the peak of the field, the electron will come back essentially at the zero crossing, having gained, gone out as far as it can and having been driven back by the field as best it possibly can, and anything after that is going to slow it back down again. Okay, so the maximum energy the electron can have when it recollides is, I've represented them by arbitrary numbers to show you the basic idea. So there will be a burst of energy from those electrons that come back, recollide, and recombine here, a burst of energy that's higher energy when they recombine here and still here. It's a continuous set of frequencies scanning over the frequencies or the energies in the problem. The energies are given by F equals MA, and that's essentially correct. There's no quantum mechanical, I mean, I'm sure there are quantum mechanical corrections, but essentially everybody just uses the F equals MA like answer. Uh, so F equals MA you can do in your head. The stronger the field, the higher the energy the electron comes back, but the atom doesn't give you a lot of choice. It's going to tunnel and it'll be all over by the time the field gets high. So you're kind of stuck with the field. The atom will, to a certain extent, give you flexibility but not very much. On the wavelength, however, you've got tremendous flexibility. So the best thing you could do if you want high energy is pull it out with a long wavelength, get it a long way out, and then drive it back for a long time and throw it as hard as you can at the ion. So it's possible in real experiments to push up to a kilovolt energy of the electron recolliding, creating a kilovolt photon from an infrared photon to start. This is a process that's two, three, four thousand photons involved. You can imagine a perturbative nonlinear optics has long since gone out the window. In much of the work that's been done, it's been done at 800 nanometers. And if you take, say, neon as the atom, the electron that you drive back in practice can go up to 100 eV or a little more than 100 eV. You can see the synchronization of all the frequencies here because the red comes before the blue, which comes, or green comes before the blue. A chirped pulse is naturally made, but a chirp pulse in which the spectral phase is ordered by the laser field itself. We would need a way to get rid of that chirp in order to do everything just perfectly, but we have the phased frequencies there in place. You can see it right from F equals MA. So you can go back and just work this out tonight as another homework assignment. As a matter of fact, I wanted to say before I left, I'm emphasizing two things. There's an electron deeply involved in this problem, and the electron is giving its energy to the photon, and I'm talking about the photon energy, but there was an electron with a thousand eV behind that photon, that electron could give out a photon, it could scatter, it can do other things. There's a whole rich physics based on that electron. In fact, if you think of a 1,000 eV electron, its wavelength is 0.1 angstroms. 
And so we have something with a resolution limit on the order of a fraction of the separation between atoms deeply inside the problem. We can either use it directly to do diffraction or holography, or we can use it indirectly by what it reports out to the photon. But there was that electron, it had that wavelength, and whatever information you can get from that will be reported, can be reported to the photon. So I'll show you how that occurs to, in, this afternoon. Okay, so is everybody comfortable with this, this figure? You have to be comfortable with it because this is the essence. There's nothing else you could leave now, but now you know everything. It's not quite true, but, uh, but you know a lot. Okay, <clears throat> so I said homework. Uh, please, uh, using F equals MA and linearly polarized light, please determine the time and energy of recollision for an electron born at some time T1 with velocity equals zero and position equals zero. It's a bit like the circularly polarized one. Okay, this will give you a set of trajectories. It will give you a set of moments of birth related to a set of moments of recollision, one moment of birth related to one moment of recollision, and an energy of recollision. These are classical trajectories, and if we impose quantum mechanics weight on it, these are quantum trajectories, and they're called just exactly that. And you can work it out, it will take you no time. It's again classical physics. It's a first year problem, okay? First year physics. They map the time of birth uh, to the time spectral phase of the electron recollision. Okay, so this is called the three step model. Three steps because the three steps are ionization. I told you that often it's tunneling, but even if tunneling isn't exactly right, the electron still has to feel the field, and so there are aspects, a great deal of this will survive, even if you, it's a tunneling approximation begins to break down. It involves semi-classical motion in the laser field, and it involves photo recombination to the parent ion. That's the three steps. Okay, so I've shown you what happened in a single cycle pulse. That's not a realistic pulse, a pulse. I just started it arbitrarily and stopped it arbitrarily to be able to show you one full range of short trajectories. Actually, I should go back and mention that too since I've got lots of time. I talked about those electrons that collided early, middle, and late. It's possible for an electron to be born before 17 degrees. And if you do F equals MA, ignoring the ion, F equals MA, you'll find that they collide after the zero crossing of the field. Their energy works its way back down again. If I were to plot it, there would be a green one up here and then a red one further up still. So actually, the radiation that's created from the atom chirps up in frequency and then back down in frequency. Largely, we only think about the short trajectories and I won't try to justify very much how you can let go of the long trajectory, called long trajectories for the obvious reason, they're longer in path, but they have a different phase as a function of intensity, and in a Gaussian beam, they tend to diffract away, and in a real experiment, you don't have to worry about them. Or you can set up, maybe a better way to say it, you can set up an experiment so you don't have to worry about them. So largely, people talk about short trajectories, which is there. Okay, so that's um, a single cycle, but a single cycle pulse perhaps is too simple. Let's take a longer pulse and say what happens in a longer pulse. Well, although I'm giving you classical physics description, we all know it's quantum mechanical. So the atom, I've shown here a molecule, but it's all right. The atom might ionize at some time. Let's imagine it's there. Comes back, recollides, giving you a burst of radiation. It might ionize here, come back and give you a burst of radiation. Might have ionized back there, give you a burst of radiation. So a real pulse gives you an attosecond pulse, followed by an attosecond pulse, followed by an attosecond pulse. These bursts of radiation, I, maybe I didn't say the bursts, so maybe I'll go back, go back one more time. So this range of times is a fraction of a cycle, maybe about a quarter. So 2.7 divided by a quarter is uh, sub femtosecond. So these are at a second pulses, approximately. And if we get rid of the chirp, of course, they could be very much, very, very short. Oops. 
So we have an at a second pulse followed by an at a second pulse followed by an at a second pulse, separated one from the other by half a laser cycle. If the material is symmetric, they're identical except one is coming one way and one is coming the other way. They're just opposite one from the other. So they have an opposite sign. Fourier transform, we have a series of frequencies, just like always from a, a train, a series of frequencies. And because they flip sign every time, every alternate one, it's odd harmonics. Shown here is a non-symmetric material, and there are even harmonics. This figure was made up for a polar molecule, and you probably can't see this too much light. But if you look carefully in there, you'd see some even harmonics that are weak. <clears throat> so that's high harmonics. High harmonics are just a train of at a second pulses. Um, now, I put this in just to make sure I do not forget to say that we think of, I've argued this for a single atom or a single molecule, but it isn't a single molecular effect. This is nonlinear physics. And it has phase matching in it, just like any other or many other nonlinear processes. So we have a gas of, gas of molecules, or atoms. And this gas are all contributing in phase to the process. So you can think about it that along comes the, I can't step out here, I guess. Along, along comes the pulse. It ionizes this atom, comes back, and it creates a burst. And it propagates along with the radiation it created. The next atom. Again, and the burst is identical, atom to atom to atom, and they build up in a phase-matched way as long as the velocity of propagation of the fundamental and the XUV remain in sync. Now, that's a very severe restriction, and so phase-matching can give you problems, but as long as you keep the density low and things like that, this is a phase-matched output. It's a severe restriction because the process itself is ionizing the medium, changing the medium. It would be like taking your second harmonic crystal and, and uh, melting it as you make the second harmonic. And so that has some limits. And equally here, we're modifying the medium as you make the, the material. Not every atom that ionizes recombines and gives you radiation. Some give you a background in which uh, dispersion can give you problems. OK, so this is a gas. We use a supersonic jet, which is illustrated here. Um, about in the interaction region, tantor, something like that, of gas pressure, um, interacting over a distance of a millimeter or so, something like that. But you can use many other things. Uh, we use often rare gases, but we use molecules. Uh, you know, Lots of things can be put in, placed in here. Uh, now, coming out the other side is the harmonic radiation. And if you go directly into a spectrograph for harmonics that I described to you before, here they look. This would be a set made in argon, 25 EV, 20, uh, 25 EV. This would be about the 15th harmonic of 800 nanometer light, 17, 19, 21, 23, 25. You see them going out. The spectrum this way, and this is just a spectrograph reading. There's nothing interesting in that. If we use a short, a single cycle or approximately single cycle pulse coming in here, then there is only one recollision. You create an at a second pulse. And the at a second pulse is shown here, spectrum along here, on approximately the same scale. So in this case, it's going out to about 100 or maybe 120 EV. And in the vertical plane is a reconstruction of the spatial structure of that pulse as it leaves the medium. But I'll discuss that later, how it's made. So that's the spectrum as you would measure in both cases. So it gives you a sense for the spectra using uh, Thai sapphire and rare gases. OK, so now you know about harmonics. And you know sort of approximately how a single at a second pulse is made. How is it really done in a real laboratory? So there are a number of different ways. And I'll describe them to a certain extent here. And then I will use one as an example. So one thing you can do, this was the first thing that was done, is to use a near single cycle pulse. I showed you that these can be made from oscillators. You heard yesterday how you can use fibers to compress beams. And so even out of a reasonable amplified pulse, you can amplify a pulse at about 25 femtoseconds reasonably well. 
and you can put it into a fiber. Generally, we use just a hollow core fiber and compress down to a cycle and a half, something like that. So a pulse that looks very much like sketched here. So how does it work? Imagine it might ionize on one of the crests, but maybe this crest isn't strong enough to ionize. So nothing happens on that. Of course, this crest must be, or else nothing will happen altogether. So ionization might occur on this crest. The electron is pulled away by this strong field and driven back and recolliding back here about a cycle and a half, about a, a three quarters of a cycle later. A burst of radiation is created, high energy electrons going up to the extreme energy in the problem. Of course, ionization might occur also at the next half cycle, and the electron is pulled away by this strong field, but driven back by an increasingly weakened field, coming back and hitting feebly, if at all, feebly in practice, and recombining, giving you not such short wavelength radiation. Look through a filter, and you've got a single burst of attosecond pulses. So this is one way. This is the first way that was shown, and it's a very good way. You must look through a filter near the cutoff. Um, another way is to use time-dependent polarization. So I asked you to do a uh, calculation for what happens in circularly polarized light and what happens in the nearly polarized. Let, let's talk about it quickly here. If you took circularly polarized light, let's imagine the field is pointing in this direction and the electron ionizes. Off it comes, but the field is changing its direction, so the electron trajectory will go like this. It will never come back and collide. Just way over there, its motion will be like this, cusp-like motion. OK, so even an elliptically polarized light, it will do that to a certain extent. And as long as it's moved away further than, well, we, measured, we calculated the lateral velocity. So as long as it's moved away further than the lateral velocity is extended out, then it will miss also. So you have to be very close to linear in this process to get any radiation. Now, you can, another way to look at this, you all, you all know a lot about spectroscopy, and you probably, at, in nonlinear optics, of course. So, of course, there's one unit of angular momentum for the photon you're creating. And if you had circularly polarized light, there's one unit of angular momentum for each photon involved. How could I possibly take 1,000 photons, 1,000 units of angular momentum, and transfer it into one? It's not possible, right? So we know for other reasons that circularly polarized light will not give you a burst, any radiation. Even elliptically polarized light, we've got an imbalance between the number of left and right circular, and there are so many photons involved that you've got to get that balance right to get one unit. And so you have to be very close to linear. So a beam that looks like that changing from circular, well, maybe you can't tell what that looks like, so, because it's not so easy, is it? So it starts circular. It comes down to linear, and then it goes circular again the other way. So that's what's sketched there. I guess the sketch isn't so clear. And this sounds like a terrible pulse to make. How would you ever make such a pulse? I'm sure you're thinking. But it turns out that it's not so complicated to make. If you put, it, put a beam through wave plates, the difference velocity along each axis of a wave plate allows you, let me see, I've got to get my distance allows you to separate one polarization relative to the other. So now you might imagine, say it's a quarter wave plate, that you've got linear, because this one got ahead. Now it's circular, because it's a quarter wave plate. Now it's linear, because this one fell behind. Perpendicular, circular, well, one polarization circular, the other polarization. Put it through another quarter wave plate, and you have what you need. So it's passive ways to do it, and there are a number related to something like this. So that's called polarization gating, and it's used now increasingly around the world. Now, it's possible to augment the process with adding a second harmonic. So uh, any of these processes, really. So let's think about that. If I, well, it's even sketched there. If I take a fundamental and a second harmonic, here's my fundamental beam. I have a second harmonic, and let's phase it so that the peaks are just superimposed here. So I have a bigger peak because I have the two of them. But down here, the next half cycle away of the fundamental, they're unfazed, and so I subtract and I add. So instead of having a symmetric beam, I got one high and one low. 
And so ionization will only occur in this one. Nothing happens in this. So now it's every cycle instead of every half cycle. I don't need so, such a good gate with second harmonic to add. So it's called, um, so it can be augmented by or polars. It's, uh, well, it can be augmented with use of a harmonic radiation. So often these two are put together and a harmonic is added. And it turns out to be quite an effective way. A neat way is a new idea that came from Fabien Carré in Paris. And I'm going to show you that one because I've been doing some work with Fabien. And uh, I'll show you how it works. It's slightly different than the other. And it's, I'll show you much more detail. So maybe I won't say much about it. I'll come back to it in a minute. And so maybe these are, these are currently the prominent methods. But the other methods would work. Um, so here's the part that I thought I would show you one case. <clears throat> so let's imagine we have a few cycle pulse. Well, this can be, you can see, you can imagine the envelope from here. Let's imagine you have a few cycle pulse that you create from a tie sapphire laser. Now let's imagine you do something that you would think you just should not do. You bring it through a prism. Well, I guess we already said that. We know it's useful some places, but... Now, largely, you don't want to do this. Take a, take a short pulse apart. Make the wedge really small. And so in practice, often, you might use two prisms that are identical, but don't put them, unbalance them a little bit. OK, so if you think about what happens now when you go out into the far field and you focus, I have one frequency preferentially in one side of the focus and a different frequency on the other, the red separated from the blue. Now, don't do it so much that they're really separated, just barely separated. So here it is sketched. There's the, there's the blue side, and here's the red side. So it might be interesting to, to link the crests. There they are linked. And you can see that every half cycle, the wavefront is slightly different one from the other. So it's a wavefront rotation that you create. Every half cycle, the wavefront rotates. So now think about what happens in that beam when you make harmonics. Electron comes out, comes back, recollides, out back, recollides, out back, recollides, creating radiation that's going out in that direction, normal or more or less normal to the wavefront of the fundamental. The next half cycle, the same thing will happen. Electron comes out, recollides, 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 and the electron goes out normal to that half, that. And so each, uh, not electron, the photon, the radiation. And so each add a second pulse will go in a slightly different direction. And they will separate in the far field. So that's a way to make isolated add a second pulse. As a matter of fact, make two or three of them. You could use them for pump probe. It's kind of a neat idea. It's different than the others. I thought I would illustrate it and use it to illustrate measurement as well. So here it is in practice. We have a beam that's making harmonics. Very short pulse, so you can see they're not well-defined harmonics. And there's no space-time chirp in here, and there's what it looks like in space. Frequency here, spatial position there. Looked at through a, on a, a detector after going off the spectrograph. Okay. Now we add this space-time chirp so that the directions are moving in the imaging direction in our spectrograph. So we can see it. So here is position. Here, here is frequency there, and otherwise the same except for this chirp, spatial chirp that we've added. And here you can see the little beamlets each coming out one, two, three, four. In this case, or three, depends on what you want to count for this one. Three beamlets or four beamlets coming out, each going in a slightly different direction. They don't look so well defined here. They don't look so well defined, but you have to remember that everything here is depending on the carrier envelope phase. And as a matter of fact, they will move up and down with the carrier envelope phase. I can't remember if I put that in. I might have. Uh, no, I didn't. I thought about putting it in, and I didn't remember if I did or not. So if you move the carrier envelope phase of the beam, this whole thing just tracks down with the carrier envelope phase. A new one shows up. A new one. I can't illustrate that with my fingers. But a new one keeps showing up. and. Uh, so this is slight movement because of the carrier envelope phase jitter. Actually, the modulation is a measurement of the overlap. So let's 
choose one. Let's put an aperture and make a measurement. So there's an aperture. We're going to put an aperture through, only let one get through and measure the pulse. And there it is. I'm going to now tell you about how the measurement occurs, but I want to just show you while I'm still here at the measurement of an isolated at a second pulse. Shown here is time delay. Shown here is energy or spectrum. I'll tell you why it is. So it's a two-dimensional measurement, just like frog. This will be a frog-like measurement. Okay, so that's one of the reasons I introduced you to the frog. It's going to be a similar measurement. I'll show you in a minute. And here is what we get for the spectrogram. And here's the reconstructed pulse in intensity versus time. And I don't have the phase on this, but I could have put a phase. Okay, so there's an isolated at a second pulse. And I hope you understand and could follow the approach to producing it and, and, me and me measuring it I'm going to talk about right now. Okay, so there's a number of ways to measure at a second pulses. Um, but the gold standard, I would say, is the at a second street camera. And so the idea is really simple. So you could, you could go out and try to do like we do in the visible and try to find a way to autocorrelate, get the pulse to measure itself. But, you know, it's hard to get a beam splitter for XUV. How, how would you ever make sure it doesn't do something to the pulse you want to measure in this beam splitter? And what's the nonlinear material you can use in the XUV? And we don't have much intensity, really, anyway. So really, that route seems very unlikely to be effective. So instead, a better way is to make a photoelectron replica of the pulse. So that's the basic idea. So produce an attosecond photoelectron replica, and then streak the replica, uh, streak the replica using a laser field. So that's why it's called the attosecond streak camera. And I don't know if any of you know anything about a streak camera. It's an older way of making a measurement. OK, it's really easy to see. It's so easy, I can, I think, explain it with my hands. I should have prepared for it. Um, so before autocorrelation and anything, the very early, early days of short pulses, the first thing people thought about was to measure pulses by streaking them. So the idea was I bring, I have a photocathode. I bring a pulse into the photocathode. I create photoelectrons, a photoelectron replica, if you like, now, here it is by the cathode. It wasn't very useful. So they would put a strong field on this photoelectron, get them out as fast as they can, trying to keep them together, deliver them to a place where there are two electrodes, and they would charge them up as fast as you can, one positive, one negative. And so as it charged up, the electron beam would be deflected. And if the electron beam was spread out because the pulse was long, some parts were deflected more than the other, and you had a streak could see the streak that was told you the length of the pulse. So the fast process was the time-dependent field. You couldn't put it on that fast. So we don't use it because it's no good in, in femtoseconds. It's only good for relatively long pulses. OK, but so the idea of the at a second streak camera is somewhat similar. In these terms, I didn't prepare it quite this way, but I'll still tell you. In these terms, instead of the photocathode, I mean, photocathode is hopeless in that a second. Let's just let the gas go everywhere, and we'll photoionize an atom right in place. We'll never move the electron. We'll just photoionize. So that's great. That should respond really fast. Then instead of putting on a time-dependent field on electrodes, which is limited, we can only do it in a nanosecond, use a laser field. A laser field is just as good, and it's turning, it's moving up and down on a femtosecond time scale. So we'll use a laser field to deflect or add energy, a similar idea, to the photoelectron energy and thereby label its moment of entering the laser field. So that's the idea. I'm going to show it to you now in, a, in, a, in an image. So that's why it's called the add a second streak camera, because it's a direct analog to a streak camera. So you have an atom. That's going to be now an atom you understand. You want to understand it completely, just like any other measurement. You want to understand the thing in which you're doing the measurement, because the pulse is the issue. 
the atom, we come along with the XUV pulse, make a photoelectron by photoionizing it. The energy of the electron that we create is going to be um, the photon energy minus IP, or the range of photon energies minus IP. This will be a photoelectron pulse just like the attosecond pulse. The phase of the photoelectron at each frequency is determined by the transition moment from the atom. So that's the process. If you want to think of it quantum mechanically, the amplitude of the electron that we put in the continuum is shown here. The transition moment, bringing it up, the amplitude of the field that's doing it, and then the electron accumulates phase as a continuum electron as it propagates along, and we're going to start to manipulate and play with that phase in a quantum mechanical sense. In a classical sense, we're going to manipulate the energy. Both of them will be good. Now let's imagine doing exactly the same experiment, but this time we want to have a laser field present when we do it. Okay, so I've shown you three different possible phases of the laser field relative to the attosecond pulse. The attosecond pulse here is illustrated just by an arrow. So let's think about what happens. You can think of it classically, or we can put it in the, the quantum mechanical equation. It's okay. Either are okay. So let's think of it classically. Let's imagine that electron is released by an attosecond pulse right here. So the electron will go whatever direction it's going to go, but its energy is as we said before. And the fact that the electron was in the presence of a field and was oscillated was okay because I turned off the field. It went back to the same uh, energy when it, it had at the peak of the field. So that's the black circle. Depending on what direction we look, we see the photoelectron energy. Of course, this would be a blur, be a range of energy if the pulse is short. Okay, now let's imagine instead of that that we came with the at a second pulse phase to the laser field so that it was at the zero crossing of the field. You're going to say, maybe I can't do that, but remember how we make at a second pulses. We make it with a laser field, and this electron comes back and it hits at well known phases. So we know everything about the relative phase between the at a second pulse and the laser field. Now the electron enters the field, it gets its initial velocity, which is the black circle, but F equals MA works on it, and it pushes this electron, and if we work out to the end of the pulse, we will find that the circle is offset. That is, if you look in this direction, I will get more energy. If I look in this direction, I will get less energy, and so I have moved or streaked, I've moved the energy of the electron by the fact that I've moved. If I go back to the other, it goes the other direction. And it's just F equals MA. Again, F equals MA with an initial condition. And you'll find the velocity as a function of time is given by that, where V sub zero is the initial velocity, A is the vector potential at the moment of birth, and this is the vector potential at the time you wish to look. We're going to look at T equals infinity when A T is zero. And so the velocity that we measure in, at time equals infinity will depend on the moment of birth. So now we have a way of looking at the range of moments of birth. In fact, we'll be able to move this time-dependent field relative to the at a second pulse and watch this spectrum move and change and so on. Let me give you just one time, one illustration of what the spectrum looks like. Here is a calculation for a 70 at a second pulse, 70 at a second pulse, in the field of 6 times 10 to the 14 for helium, assuming it's helium. And the phase is set, the phase is set so that the rapid change in, uh, well, you can imagine this sweeps out and in in a sine wave-like behavior. And so we get the maximum dispersion or the maximum modification to the, the field. So this is the initial photoelectron spectrum without the infrared field. And there's what the infrared field does, it, does to it. There's actually two calculations superimposed here, one in circles, one in dots. One is a classical calculation, one's a quantum calculation. So go home and do the classical calculation, and you'll get it right. Um, it can see, let's just look at what happens for a 35 at a second pulse chirp to 70 at a seconds. 
So it has a chirp on it. And we'll do the same thing. We'll put it at the same time. The 35 at a second pulse um, is shown with just the spectrum there. But the chirp, depending on which way, where we put it in the field, you can actually be stretching it out with the chirp or working against the chirp. So we see the effects of the chirp. In fact, going back here again, we're doing everything by modifying the P here, modifying the phase. That's the quantum mechanical way to look at it. OK, so this is a spectrum at every time, every time step, or a, a frog. And you can actually, it turns out, use frog algorithms to fully reconstruct the pulse. I wanted to give it clear how you get the spectrum, what information is in, and frog algorithms can be used. So it could, that's why I wanted to introduce frog. Um, how does it look in practice? And this is just a sketch. You know, you make your laser beam, all the work is out there in the laser beam. It's focused into the gas. Uh, the gas, the fundamental and the harmonic go together. You could block the fundamental and let the harmonic go through and catch it on a mirror. And you could allow some of the fundamental to escape around the side and catch it in an outside mirror and focus them independently on the same region. And now you can simply move one mirror with respect to the other. And so, and then look at the photoelectrons. This is just a sketch, and I think somehow this one got moved. OK, so it's rather conceptually straightforward. And it's not that much. Everything's in vacuum, so it's complicated because of the vacuum. Otherwise, it's not complicated. <clears throat> As with autocorrelation and pump probe, knowing, uh, using a known sample, we measure an unknown pulse. Or no, using a known pulse, the same experiment can resolve an unknown process. So I won't try to give you an example. I think this is a nonlinear optics meeting. I won't give you really examples of it. But you can imagine replacing the gas with the solid. Along comes the XUV pulse creates photoelectrons from the solid, just like in an old photocathode. And then the laser field catches them and labels them. And maybe you can see different time response for different electrons coming out of the solids. In fact, that experiment was done by the group in Munich. And they see different time response for an electron coming from different states inside the solid, different bands in the solid. So there's a delay between them, only a few tens of attoseconds. But those are easily observable, and that's how you can do experiments. Again, a pump probe experiment is just like a measurement experiment, except you don't know the process. So taking stock, <clears throat> I would say we understand just about everything, the major characteristics of recollision from F equals ma. And we understand the major characteristics of the Adistec second street camera and the production of the Adistecan with F equals MA. I showed you how close the two calculations could be on the Adistec second street camera. It's amazing. Right? So where is quantum mechanics in all of this? I mean, it's really amazing that F equals MA can be so good. I mean, it's really amazing. Um, so now I want to introduce you to quantum mechanical way of looking at it. This might be a good time to break for five minutes. I would perhaps have waited for a little longer because make it more close to the center. But uh, maybe this is still a good time because this is a natural break in the talk. OK, so I'm going to start again. And this time, I want to concentrate on quantum mechanics. <clears throat> so how could it possibly be that an atomic process is so well described classically. And if we add quantum mechanics, do we get any better insight? And can we do anything more? So I'm going to do like I've done before. I'm not going to be too complicated. I'm going to add quantum mechanics by hand. I'll show you how to do it less than by hand, but I'll introduce it by hand. So here's a quantum mechanical perspective on how this process works. So let me talk it through, just like I did the classical one. I have a, an electron, which is now not a classical particle, but a wave function. Think of hydrogen atom for now. A wave function 
It's trapped in a Coulomb potential. The Coulomb potential is in the presence of a field which tips it, and the electron is free to tunnel from the atom. Tunneling is the beam splitter, as I introduced you before. The electron that tunnels through the atom is not a classical electron. It's a wave packet. It tunnels over a range of time near when the peak of the field is curves. Tunneling would say about over 300 femtoseconds, 300 attoseconds, sorry, but 300 attoseconds, half of which classically can re-collide, half of which won't. And so this complex wave packet is moved away from the atom by the laser field, and components of it can be thought of a bit like the trajectories that we've talked about. Some components of this wave packet will simply drift away, and we don't care about them. Some components of this wave packet will be driven back again and overlap the, the part from which it came. We know from classical physics that time of birth will lead to time and energy of recollision, and we can put semi-classical semi mechanics upon this and imagine a wave on top of it. But this will not be one, it will be a range of waves that will be sweeping over it as these trajectories, as these trajectories evolve. When the electron comes back, so this illustration is supposed to show you that. I tell people sometimes that this is a Picasso-inspired illustration because you see the left side, the right side, the front of the face all at once. Here you see all the different things the wave packet is doing, uh, and it's doing all kinds of things, and I don't mean this to be realistic. If I wanted it realistic, I'd put a movie up. And, but it's kind of messy in a movie. You can't see it nearly so well. <clears throat> especially this, because the wave packet's doing many things. So at the moment of overlap now, I have two parts of the same wave function, two parts of the same wave function. They interfere, right? They interfere. And so that interference leads to a dipole, and the dipole is a transition moment. So I can think about this whole process of the electron coming out, coming back, and recolliding as an interferometer, a sheared interferometer, because I changed the wavelength of the electron. So I can map this onto an interferometer. The electron along this trajectory picks up tens or hundreds or thousands or probably in the case of four micron light, making harmonics up to a kilovolt, probably tens of thousands or even hundred thousands of phase. And I need almost nothing to modify an interferometer, just like we use a micrometer, even though we have physical distances for an interferometer. So this is an interferometer, an interferometer made from a molecule or an atom or a molecule's own electrons. It's a way to look at it. I think it's a powerful way. So you're going to say, how do I read the interferometer? You probably already know because how, how else would it be? I read the interferometer through the high harmonics or the attosecond pulses that are produced. Let me just look at it again. I spoke about it a minute ago. Here is the recollision electron. You see it there now as a plane wave instead of a single one. Here is the Gaussian pulse that was there before. You have a minimum overlapping the Gaussian. So there's the total. You can see the minima and the maxima. You can square it to get the probability, or you can see the dipole at that moment in time, and there it is. So the dipole is on one side of the atom because of this interference. But this electron is moving rapidly, and so where once there was a minimum, now there's a maximum, and so on. Square it, and so the dipole moves because the interference is moving because of the motion of the wave packet. So I have an oscillating dipole, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, emitting radiation. Now you can see the frequency of the radiation because it's the oscillation of the dipole. As the electron changes, the oscillation will change, the frequency will change. So you understand where the frequency comes. You understand the phase, because the phase of the oscillation is determined by the amplitude and phase of the recollision electron is transferred to the light through the dipole moment or the transition moment. Okay, So I read the interferometer. I read this interference by looking at the light that's created. Um, so in a way, it's a way to think about beginning to look and use the wavelength of the electron, right? Because the wavelength of the electron has been critical to this dipole. In fact, as I change the wavelength of the electron, I'll change this considerably. 
And the wavelength of the electron, I'll remind you, is varying in this problem somewhere between a fraction of an angstrom, if you go to a kilovolt, I won't be doing that, but if you do, to uh, about three angstroms. So right in the really interesting and critical size for atoms, molecules, and things like that. Okay, I think that's everything I wanted to say. This is just an equation in the strong field approximation for that dipole or transition moment. It's psi er times uh, the continuum, which e to the i kx, e to the i omega t, so the e to the i kx is there, e to the i omega t, or ip plus kinetic energy is there. So that's the dipole. And you can see already that that's very close, except for this boring part, to a Fourier transform of the orbital. So it'll eventually come, I'll eventually talk about that. And you can also see that if you think about that interference, that interference is stuck to the size of the wave function. In other words, if I understand the interference, I understand a lot about the wave function. Okay, let me just try to give you just a direction of thought. I won't do any more than this on how you can make that more, um, more mathematical. So you can for formally uh, solve the Schrodinger equation by an initial wave function that you wish to start from at t equals zero and operate on it by the operator. This is only a formal solution where this is the total Hamiltonian in the problem integrated from the time t equals zero to the time of observation and you get the final wave function. This has done nothing except re-expressed Schrodinger equation in a different form. It's not very useful. I haven't done much. However, it gives you an access to start to approximate, and the only way to deal with this problem is through approximation. So you could approximate this by saying, from time t equals zero, nothing happens. The atom is simply, a molecule is simply, or the electron is simply in the atom. And so there it is. We'll integrate from time equals zero, and we'll pretend that the laser field is not on the atom, and it just evolves on its own. That would be an approximation, of course but maybe physically it makes some sense. And so that would be that part of it. Then, of course, it makes a jump. And so that's the transition. That's the V of T. And so there it is there. And then from then on, the electrons in the continuum, and we could do what we did classically. We could say, as soon as the electrons in the continuum, the ion is not so important, and it's soon going to disappear. So let's just pretend it's not there. And then this is the motion, or this is the propagation of the electron in the continuum. As long as the ion's not there, it's easy. So this is a route to setting up uh, a real theory. And that theory you can find in Levenstein et al. from 1994. So it uses this approximation that is physically inspired to this formal solution to Schrodinger equation. <clears throat> OK, so, but I'm going to stay with the qualitative picture now. So I wanted to tell you about experiments and the ways to control it. So I said that the basic process is an interferometer, an electron interferometer created by light from an atom's own electrons. OK, so if it's an interferometer and we want to use it, what do we do with a normal interferometer? We move the length of the arms. We change something in the interferometer. So what do we have access to do? Well, one thing we could do is we could change the intensity of the light and therefore change the trajectory. That would be a way of changing the arm length of the interferometer. But there's a much more beautiful way to do it. You could bring along a second color. Let's imagine the second harmonic of the fundamental. So as the electron goes along this trajectory, which is now caused by the fundamental, the second harmonic, which could be very weak, could, if it's appropriately phased, just add to the action along this path. Add to it just a little bit to modify the phase just a bit as it goes along this path. And then, well, if it did that, and if this is harmonics, when it comes along the other side, it will just subtract from it. And so I unbalance the interferometer it was the harmonics, or I control an interferometer if you think of it as a single out of second. It works both ways. Okay, So a second harmonic, even weak, adds to the VDV-like work if it's appropriately phased, adding phase because it adds to the action along the path. 
It need to do very little, just like your micrometer in an ordinary interferometer needs to do very little to do something that's observable. So the other thing you could do, of course, you could bring this second color at a different polarization and bring the electron in from an angle, and then you could make a sheared interferometer in space as well. So you have all these things you could play with. I would say you have as much control over this interferometer made by light as you do over a physical interferometer in your lab with the micrometer. Right? This, you have beautiful control over this interferometer because I can have the second harmonic weak and beautifully phased. So I want to now use that process and I want to bring us back to perturbative nonlinear optics. So uniting perturbative and extreme nonlinear optics. I want to show you how you can use this control over the electron. So the experiment I want to do, um, the experiment I want to do, I didn't realize the headline was there, so don't, it's a different perspective on it, is to bring a strong laser field along, create harmonics as normal along in this direction, and I want to bring a weak second harmonic field along here at an angle relative to the fundamental. So now the electrons coming from the fundamental are coming out here, out here, out here. And the second harmonic is not quite parallel. So there's a phase slew between the fundamental and second harmonic. Some places it's adding to the trajectory, sometimes it's subtracting. Some places it's adding, some places it's subtracting. It's creating a phased grating essentially in the material because I'm modifying this interferometer arm, modifying the phase of the harmonics that are created. And so I should see radiation diffracted off that phase grating, and I want to show you what they look like. So here's the photon number here, along here. The original harmonics observed in this experiment went from 13 to 25. I don't think you can see them all, but you can see enough. And here's the angle, or the divergence in milliradians. And the white line along here is the radiation, if I had no blue perturbing field on at all. No grading whatsoever. But the presence of the perturbing field, or this, this actually was relatively strong, adds a new color and a new angle. A new angle because it diffracted off first order diffraction. Or you could say the momentum of the blue beam has to contribute. You can think of it in momentum or you can think of a diffraction. Has to contribute, moving it off axis, and there is the first photon of blue uh, measured. We know it's uh, a photon, so it's 12 photons plus one. We know it's one extra photon because the momentum pushes it up, so we know for sure, and the energy makes it clear there was one odd, one uh, photon. And here is two, and here is three, and four, etc. So now I can now turn down the blue, and I can watch and see what happens, and how does this behave, and that's what's shown here. So the first thing you will see is the intensity of the blue, the weak beam, is changed here. And the signal that we see measured on those peaks that I showed you before, they can be any one of the peaks. It can be the sum of the peaks where we have added uh, one photon, two photons, three photons, four photons, five or six. That is off the axis by one, two, three, four units of momentum for the blue photon. Actually, if you look at this, it looks very perturbative, doesn't it? Um, the sixth order process has a slope of six. That's what the straight line is. Fifth order process has a slope of five, fourth, four, three, two, one. They're actually ordered in the, just like you would expect from perturbative nonlinear optics, the lowest order process is more important than the next order, than the next order. So high order, there's higher order, lower signal, and the signal grows with the order squared, just like we expect from perturbative nonlinear optics. So we've created or we have integrated, or we found a way to bring ideas from perturbative nonlinear optics into here. Through the manipulation of the electron in the continuum is what we're doing. That's how it's coming in. Actually, assuming a reasonable conversion efficiency of about 10 to the minus 5, linear scaling with intensity for the one photon process, only a few photons of perturbing beam are needed to ensure at least one off-axis photon at some harmonic frequency. It's amazingly true. 
it's better, it's, you, actually you can look at the infrared scaling, it's probably better with an infrared than it is in the visible. Ionizing atoms are extremely nonlinear. They will lead, I think, to an interesting attosecond quantum optics. So I felt I would like to say that here because so much of this is perturbative, and I want to say that there's an avenue to bring in ideas of perturbative nonlinear optics and think about what creative we can do with them. Okay, so that's using the control over the trajectory and how it can use, we can control trajectories and how we can use it. Now I want to take a general perspective, which I'm going to follow for almost the rest of the, uh, the, the day. <clears throat> I want to say that this trajectory control can give us completely unusual diagnostics. First, I want to use it on the laser pulse itself. Then I want to use it on things that are outside. Measure the laser pulse, measure something you don't know. The same formula we've used before. Okay? And I want to, I'll end up this, uh, this session by telling you what we can measure that we could not measure before and let you think about, is it even possible to make such measurements? Because I'm going to say, maybe it isn't. And I want you to think over lunch. So I'm just getting you prepared so you can listen for it at the end of this, this lecture and think it over lunch. So I'm going to look at space-time measurement of the attosecond pulse as it's being created. And I'm going to look at, um, I'll look at the time-dependent field of light. And then this afternoon, I will talk about uh, doing other things. Oops, this is out of place. OK, there, there's, what I, okay there's what I said. So I'm going to, I'll say it. Maybe I, maybe I was thinking about how to do this, right? What was the best way? So maybe I'll say it here. So during lunch, think about where you stand on measuring orbital wave functions. Okay? So I don't know. Some argue that an orbital is just intrinsically unmeasurable. So um, you can see why, right? There is no such thing as an electron in an orbital. If you've got a multi-electron atom or molecule, there's, these electrons are interplaying and interchanging with themselves. And so you think of orbitals. And if you're a chemist, you design chemical reactions in orbitals. But I think all chemists are taught that they're not real. It's just a convenient a tool that it's not real. And so you would never be able to measure them because uh, they just don't exist. <clears throat> so, um, so you can think about it. Do you agree with that or not? You can see the argument. Others argue that wave functions can't be measured, only the wave function squared. That's the only real thing. So again, you can think about it. I think that's less controversial. I think a lot of people would say wave functions could be squared. But not everybody agrees. Um, I will show you this afternoon that using only experimental data and a mathematical algorithm, you will see we'll obtain an image that looks like the HOMO orbital of a nitrogen molecule. So you can look for tricks, flaws, whatever. And you're starting to see the basic idea. I'm going to use interferometry to make the measurement. So you can think about it. I'll set it up even more, more starkly a little later on. OK, but before that, I want to take this and use it as a way to measure an attosecond pulse. An attosecond pulse, as it's being formed, in the medium as it's being formed. This would be like in your laser. As the laser is creating the femtosecond pulse, we're measuring it right there in the laser, not taking it out, moving it somewhere else. That would be the analog. So you will know basically how we're going to do it, but not quite. So here is the pulse that's going to create an isolated at a second pulse. This is this funny looking pulse that you saw before. And you know what it means. It goes from circular through linear and back circular again. And this is a nice way to make an isolated at a second pulse. And that's what we're doing. Now we bring in a perturbing field that comes in at an angle relative to this. So all there's going to be is one re-collision creating the at a second pulse. And along it, we're going to have the perturbing field. And if it's phased right, it will add a little bit to the trajectory, or add action is the right way to say it, add phase to the trajectory on this part. Maybe here, because of the difference as you move down in phase, as you move down, it will not do anything. And maybe down here in the bottom, it will subtract phase from the trajectory, modifying the phase front and tipping the beam. So if I were to look at the far field, I would see, in the absence of the blue pulse, a spatial profile that I'll sketch like that. 
And in the presence of the Bruppels, I will see a spatial profile that's modified because I've put this wedge, in a sense, on the beam with the fundamental. I keep the angles very small so I don't move out very much. Uh, we thought that was important at the time. It may be less important. I'm not positive. It may be less important than we thought. Okay, so, um, and of course, since the fundamental that created this and the second harmonic are phase related, got ordinary nonlinear optics, you know that the crystal forces a phase relation on the fundamental and the second harmonic. We know exactly the phase of the second harmonic relative to the fundamental. So here are two images. What's not shown here is a spectrograph in between. So I've got spectrum in here and spatial position here. So spatial position or divergence is sketched up there in the spectrograph you'll have to imagine in between. <clears throat> And this is exactly what you would measure in, in, a, in a measurement. And I don't know, there's an awful lot of light here, so I don't know if you can see the differences as you change the phase by, from, uh, from half a cycle, over half a cycle. But there are differences up and down, and I don't know. It's a lot of light, so I'm not sure if you can see it. I'm going to show you, I'm going to zero in on a region around 79 EV and around 45 EV. And I'm just going to take a little cut and show you what happens in space as a function of phase. And you can watch it move up and down. And there you will see it. Um, but we have this for every frequency. I, just because I take two doesn't mean we have it, don't have it for everything. We have it for everything. So there they are. This is phase delay at 46 EV, divergence there. And you can see the beam move up and down and be modulated as a result of this other beam. And here we are at 79 EV moving up and down and modulated as far as. In fact, we have a phase modulator that we're moving across the beam. It's not so much different than having this amplitude modulator in frog. In fact, frog can be set up only with a phase gate instead of an amplitude gate. As long as you do something periodic, you can do a frog reconstruction. So we have made a frog for space, and we have a 2D measurement Time delay versus which is exactly what you need for frequency resolved optical gating. So each frequency of the pulse can be looked at independently and its spatial profile measured. So I'll show you what that looks like. I can't remember exactly what I put in. No, this is a full measurement of it. There's actually a temporal measurement here too because there's a certain phase delay that tells you that is appropriate for maximum displacement, for example, for each frequency. And that tells us about the temporal structure of the pulse as well. So it's possible in this way, in the medium, as the pulse is being produced, to measure it as it's being produced. So here is a pulse. This is showing you the oscillations of a pulse measured in the medium and reconstructed in space and time through all frequency, all amplitude, all phase, space and time, and this is the oscillations of the pulse. It was a pulse driven not at 800 nanometers, but 1.8 microns, and uh, so the times are a little longer. It has chirps in it, it has problems in it, but this is an isolated at a second pulse created in this way and measured in this way. Okay, so this is the time dependent field of an at a second pulse measured by, um, by in situ. So I'd like to stop for a minute and look at this. So I, like, I think this is a very important idea, and I'd like to just stop and comment on it. Strong field processes are hardly modified by a weak field, yet a weak field can produce an indelible mark on this strong field process that allows measurement. That's what we've done here. There's a strong field process driving this along, we bring a field whose intensity is 10 to the minus 3. I'll show you eventually in solids, we can do it with 10 to the minus 5, similar ideas. So very, very weak fields are allowed, will modify the process, but they will, they will mark the process, but they will hardly ever modify such a process. And so this allows measurements. I think this is a general, pro, general idea and maybe goes well beyond optics. But I think it's a general idea for all of these strong field processes, and it can be applied beyond just high harmonics. I think it's, personally, I think. <clears throat> we don't only measure the at a second pulse, we measure also the time-dependent field in the same measurement. 
And so here is a sketch of the time-dependent field. This is really just a deflection at some frequency. This is a deflection at some frequency. And you can see that the deflection is following the time-dependent field, the E field of the laser, the blue laser pulse that drove it up and down. In fact, this was the red laser pulse. We did it with a different color for this, but this is similar. So we measure the time-dependent field. It's a petahertz all-optical oscilloscope. And you can think about it if you wish. How do we measure it? Nothing much happens until the electron goes free, and then it recombines and nothing happens again. So we have this little gate open and sensitive to the time-dependent field only for a brief instant between birth and recollision. And so that's the gate, and we move that gate to the time-dependent field and watch it go up and down. So this is, used, this is what you would do in terahertz, but it's all optical, all optical measurement of the time-dependent field of a pulse. <clears throat> now, I wanted to more or less end this part by making a connection with things that you heard before from Bob Boyd and from uh, Miles. Uh, he's gone, but I still would like to tell it. And this is an experiment that, well, I have a lab right next to Bob Boyd, as you probably know, and this is an experiment that we decided to collaborate on and indirectly involve people in Scotland, but not quite directly. It was a, a postdoc working with Bob. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, actually, had a student of mine who moved to Scotland. So I lost the student because of this. She was very good, too. So the question... Pardon? OAM than the HHG, that's exactly right. Although she's coming back to Canada, she's given a number of talks on this. So maybe she still keeps her excitement, I don't know. So um, the question is, could we impose orbital angular momentum on a harmonic beam? So before we start, what should we expect? So here's a beam, I just took this out of, uh, not out of Miles' presentation, but probably indirectly it came from Miles. I didn't take it from Miles. I got, took it from somebody else who probably took it from Miles. <laughs> he wrote the code to generate it. <laughs> probably. Okay, anyway. Um, so, well, of course, here's the beam coming through with an orbital angular momentum. I'm going to be creating an electron coming out and recolliding, and it's going to create a harmonic, and it must stay phase-matched as it propagates through. I can't allow the harmonic to fall behind the fundamental even on the scale of the harmonic wavelength, which is quite a severe restriction, isn't it? So that means that I have to have n, um, n wavelengths of the harmonic before I come to the next phase of the fundamental. And I'll be doing the same thing up there. So in other words, the twisting around, if I measure it in the fundamental, has to have n times 2 pi for the harmonic as it has for the fundamental. So we should expect that the L of the harmonic, the nth harmonic, is n times the L of the fundamental. So that's what you should expect. Actually, there was one experiment on harmonics before this, and they concluded this was not correct. There was something perhaps wrong with the idea. They weren't quite sure. And they said that the L that you could impose was only one. So we did that experiment, and you will recognize some of the ideas from what you've heard. So a forked grating, we know from yesterday, will impose orbital angular momentum on a beam. So we bring the fundamental beam into an SLM with a forked grating. The forked grating makes an orbital angular momentum on the fundamental beam. Now, there was some discussion yesterday about what happens with a large bandwidth pulse. Of course, the colors separate. This is a grating. So this is a disaster again. It's not what you want. So this grating has, I think, three periods or four periods in it, such a coarse grating that the separation in the pulse is not too bad. And the pulse is about 40 femtoseconds, so it's not too short. So we get away with it. So the beam is brought in, and we create a beam with orbital angular momentum. And we look through a slit, and we see, well, we see a portion of that beam. There it is, spatially spread out, and here's the slit of our spectrograph. So in order to see the whole thing, we take the spectrograph and just move it sideways, and we get this part, this part, this part, this part, this part. So that's the spatial structure of a beam. It's got large diameter. It looks kind of good. It's not perfect. There's problems with it. But uh, on the other hand, it looks like it might be consistent with a high orbital angular momentum. 
<clears throat> so in order to measure, measure, again, you know from Miles' talk, not yesterday, but a few days ago, that one way to measure is to bring a reference beam in and mix it with the orbital angular momentum beam and the forked at an angle. And if there were two Gaussian beams, there would just be a grating, you would see. But because of the, the slopes on the orbital angular momentum beam, you make a forked grating, and you should expect to see something like that. So let's see if we can do that. So that's exactly, well, so in order to do it, of course, we're going to take and we're going to move the slit across, and that's the measurement we make when we have two beams, each creating harmonics, one Gaussian, one with orbital angular momentum, and we let them expand and interfere with each other. So you can see the grading. I don't know if you can see it here, but there's 22 on this side and 11 on that side, and this is harmonic number 11. And you can Fourier transform here, and these are the Fourier transforms to the number of slits. So we put orbital angular momentum on, a fun, on the fundamental beam, one unit, and we get L units, 11 in this case, 13 and 15 we've looked at. So we see conservation of orbital angular momentum, not surprisingly. Um, 11th, harmonic 11 has L equals 11. Harmonic 13 and 15 have L equals 13 and 15. But by that time, it starts to get kind of messy, and it's awfully hard, and you almost have to be a believer to believe. I think 17, you have to be a believer to believe. Um, and maybe 15, I think everybody believes. It got through a referee, so I guess a critical referee believed. <clears throat> but the quality deteriorates because I think f small phase errors in the fundamental are coupled into the orbital angular momentum beam, and they lead to a mixing of orbital angular momentum. So why not use the ideas we've been talking about so far of making a grading and controlling a grading and making an SLM on the material itself? So we thought we would try it. So this trajectory control we've talked about, we should be able to make something very much like a spatial light modulator controlling the phase for high harmonics and out of second pulses in the medium itself by bringing in another color appropriately. So we did so far a calculation, and I would just simply give you the calculation. I have no experimental results, but we'll ha hopefully have them very soon. But you know all the background for why we think it should work and all of that sort of thing. So this is the idea. We bring um, a mega light in, creating harmonics. We bring a weak to a mega beam in that has orbital angular momentum imposed. We bring them together. That creates a grating just like I showed you before. It should diffract radiation out. And we should be able to couple. We'll put a fork grating in the material. It's like writing an SLM in the material. And here's the calculation. The fundamental beam alone, with no photons absorbed from the second harmonic, as shown there. And you can see it's Gaussian. Just like, it should, just like you might expect. And it's hard to see in this light, but depending if it absorbs or emits a photon, because it can do either, in from the orbital angular momentum beam or into the orbital angular momentum beam, we can see an L equals 1 beam or an L equals minus 1 beam. And so that experiment we wish to do, but I think it's unlikely not to work. So writing a spatial light modulator into the material effectively as the pulses being created. Now, I'm about almost half an hour early. It's hard to anticipate how long you're going to take in five, hour, five and a half hours talks. So next class, I want to just set it up, but it'll only take me about four or five minutes. We measure with autocorrelation or spider or frog or any method. We measure E as a function of T. That was the whole point of the first part of my talk. Or we could measure E as a function of position with a nonlinear interferometer. Sheared interferometer is very powerful, a nonlinear interferometer. I simply showed you an autocorrelator just to get you back thinking about it. Okay, that's an autocorrelation trace, and you recognize it's an interferometric autocorrelation trace. Okay? So isn't that an amazing thing that we do it? We measure everything about an optical pulse. Maybe you could say I can't do the polarization, but I think you would give me that I could get the space-time structure of the pulse fully constructed. 
So <clears throat> does nonlinear, extreme nonlinear optics allow us to make similar measurements of electrons? For example, molecular orbitals, molecular dynamics, solid state processes. If it does, then extreme nonlinear optics will bring the power to this field similar to what perturbative nonlinear optics has done. So that's really what I want to talk to you about this afternoon. I'm going to say, I'm going to try to show you that this is possible. I will talk about how to measure an orbital. I'll look some at chemical dynamics, and I'll end with solids. So that's the, that's what it is. And I told you to think, and I can't remember. So that's the class, imaging orbitals. Is it even possible? Molecular dynamics and linking gas and solid state harmonics are the, is what I'm going to talk about.